Brothers and sisters, it's, it's great to worship with you this morning together. Um, let us think about um, this Bible verse before we start worship. We're here to worship God because He is worthy for our praise. Jesus, who being in the form of God, though it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon his upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let us all stand. Let us sing this song, Glory to the Lamb. Give our glory to the Lamb on the throne. Who sacrificed, died for us to redeem us. Oh 
Good morning. I get a little emotional on that song. And uh, I don't know if it's still her favorite. I mean, as time goes by, songs come and go. And when we uh, established our burial plot, if you can imagine that, and bought a uh, tombstone, we put the words of our favorite hymn on that tombstone. And at the time, uh, Blessed Assurance was, was Sherry's song. So, and mine was that beautiful hymn, Till He Come. And I realized that we would say, Till He Comes, but uh, with poetic license, Till He Come. And uh, not that I'm anxious for that day. I, somebody said, you know, we all want to go to heaven, but not today. <laughs> and I guess that's how we think. And yet, uh, as we look at the world around us and as we deal with the situations of our experience and existence, uh, I, I love that old hymn, Sometimes I Get Homesick for Heaven. I had somebody say to me once, I don't understand that song because how can you be homesick for some place you've never been? And I said, maybe it's just we want to get out of here. <laughs> so anyway, as we uh, prepare for our time together in the Word, uh, if you don't have the scripture, um, raise your hand and we've got a handsome brother here that will make sure you get a copy. And as he gives you a copy, say, yes, that's true. You are handsome. <laughs> there you go. Everybody needs a little encouragement. So let's uh, have a time of prayer. And um, I I'm going to go ahead. Um, the scripture says we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. If there ever was a time, and uh, I mean, I lived through 1967 and 1973. Uh, I, I wasn't here in 1948. Uh, <laughs> you, were, you don't remember that, though. You had to be pretty young. And uh, those are our uh, marks on the calendar of history having to do with the nation of Israel. And I, I'm going to elaborate just a little bit here as we prepare our hearts for prayer. They're, they're important because of what took place. In 1948, uh, Israel was allowed to return to the land that God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, a land, a strip of land in the Middle East that they had been literally run out of. Their capital city, Jerusalem, uh, destroyed, burned to the ground. The temple <coughs> in Jerusalem, the temple that we're going to read about this morning in our message, was dismantled stone by stone just as Jesus had said it would be. It was a somewhat long-term prophecy of Jesus. It didn't happen in his lifetime. It happened, it happened some 40 years later, but in 70 AD, 70 AD, that incident that Jesus predicted happened right down to the detail. And that's important for us today because it is mentioned prophetically, it is predicted in Scripture by Jesus, but nowhere in the Scripture is it mentioned as having happened. That is a piece of internal evidence, actually missing internal evidence. You can only imagine that if that had taken place during the time that our Bible was being written, 
they would have said, look, exactly as Jesus predicted, this has happened in my, and in fact, even today, I'm going to say to you that what happened in 1948 gave the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob their land. Most precious to them. In 1967, they were allowed to repossess the city of Jerusalem. Most precious to the heart of the Jew. And of those three things that the people of Israel held dear, the only piece of precious property that they do not yet possess is the temple site on the holy mountain. And I believe that as we approach end times, when you see a peace agreement made involving the nation of Israel, involving them having access to the Temple Mountain. Now I know there are those that say a temple needs to be standing, but if you read in the Old Testament, uh, in Ezra, you'll find out that before the foundation stones of the temple were laid, all of the festivities and offerings and oblations that the children of Israel occupied themselves with were not only in place, but in operation even before the temple foundation stones were laid. So all they need is the location. And I believe that we are, we are tippy-toeing to the fulfillment of that yearning of their heart and I have to say with what's going on uh, even today in the Holy Land and what's going on in the regard of these recent attacks, um, we're moving forward at an alarming pace. So this morning we have cause, we have reason to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and we will do so. Uh, earthquakes in Afghanistan, uh, calamities in other places, uh, still dealing with the fire situation in Hawaii. Uh, any other items uh, that come to your mind that we need to lift up this morning? Personal? Um, silent prayer requests, lift up your hand. Let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you might our hearts be touched this morning with what touched Jesus' heart? Might we this morning be occupied with divine things? Might we be occupied with purpose established in the heavens? Might our hearts love the things that you love and might our perspective, might our ambition, our goals, our intentions be focused upon the will of God. I thank you this morning for each one that's here, young and old. I thank you especially for our young people this morning. They are the future of this gathering, of this church. Not only that, they are living in a world where those around us, as scripture says, those on the outside are in absolute and abject denial of the truth of the Word of God, even to the point of mockery. And Father, this morning touch our hearts as we look up to you in prayer. Might our desires be expressed as we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, as we pray for the hearts, as we pray for the souls of mankind in every place, as we pray for this community, for 
the world in which we live and our surroundings here, those that we love and know that have not yet come to Christ, we pray our God for them today and for this church that stands for the truth of the word of God and for the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and for the divine prospect that he who shall come will come and will not tarry. Lord, we lift our hearts to you today in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've read the Gospels, and I'm going to say you likely have, you would be aware, obviously, that the Gospel of Mark is the small one. Uh, I, I use the terms concise and complete uh, in the regard of something uh, a week or so ago. But uh, as I've been looking at the Gospel of Mark, I, I've noticed that uh, although it's concise, and it is, it's very short, I, I actually believe that from the style of the book, that it was a notebook. It was a collection of things that Mark, who is a second generation believer, uh, got from others, members of Jesus' 12 apostles, uh, members of Jesus' family, and so forth. Uh, in a few weeks, we're going to be looking at a, an incident involving Mark. I, I believe with all my heart it's Mark. He's referred to as a young lad uh, who snuck out of his bedroom late at night and actually witnessed the arrest of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And... Um, it's, it's, it's a story with an interesting and a little bit of a humorous twist to it. It might embarrass some of our kids. Um, but I think it's cute. But uh, Mark wasn't there for these incidents. And he received this information as a young evangelist and likely made his notes so that as he was out sharing the gospel, he got the details right. It's easy for us to generalize and instead of saying there were 12 people, to say there was about a dozen. The next person, they can take that story either way to more or less than 12. <laughs> and we, we tend to do that. I, I believe that Mark was cautious and careful as he was out preaching and teaching the message of the gospel, because that was specifically what he was doing, uh, to make sure that he had it right. I, I preached uh, a few times with a, a man named Walter Gustafson and uh, had mentioned a story, an event, that he particularly liked, and after the service, he came to me and he said, now that story you told about, and he asked about it, and he got his little notebook out and he began to write down details. And he said, now, uh, how many were actually there? And uh, Walter was a stickler for detail. And when I couldn't give him an ex exact number, he just put his notebook away and he said, well, if you don't know, he says, I won't use the story. I think Mark was like that. I, I think detail needed to be right, and uh, I believe that just as the other writers in the Bible saw themselves as handling the Word of God and specifically the words of God, Mark was very careful to do so. And I was surprised last night, and that's why uh, what I have here in front of me is our chapter for today, Mark chapter 11, but I also have Matthew chapter 21, and I've got some things circled in red and some things highlighted. If you want to see what my notes are like, this is what they look like. And then also Luke 19, and you'll remember that in Luke 19, verse, well, in the area where we find that verse, Luke 19 and 10, Jesus is speaking to Zacchaeus, okay? 
And, uh, well, we were talking about the blind man in previous sermons. That's where we're at. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John are all giving us their account of these things, each in their own way, each according to their own observation. It's not likely that even Luke, unless if he was one of the 70 that Jesus chose after the 12, it's not likely that Luke was actually there for some of these things and received his information from the other apostles, and certainly with Mark. He was just a boy. And yet received this information from those that were there and I believe was cautious and careful as he wrote down those particular incidents as well as their details. I, I think it's important also, especially as I've mentioned our young people here, uh, to realize that subsequent generations are vital to the message of Christ and the promotion of and the growth and development of the church. So it's important for us as we preach to give it to you right. Uh, I will tell you very specifically regarding those things that are my opinion. And it's all right to have an opinion. I think it's all right to use a little conjecture to add some of the obvious details to a story so long as you don't change the story. But we need to get it right. So here we are, Mark chapter 11. Um, as I said, this is also in Matthew and Luke. Interestingly, John omits it. And I say omits because John lets us know in his uh, in his gospel account, many other things Jesus did that are not written in, these, in this book, in this collection of things, but these are written that you might believe. And really, uh, shortly after the first week of Jesus' ministry and into the final week of Jesus' ministry, John uh, takes a giant leap. And in the opening of his gospel is concerned that we understand who Jesus is and his purpose. And in the close of the gospel of John, he's detailing the things that Jesus did and why we should believe on him. There's a whole lot left out in the middle, not wrongfully, but purposefully. I believe that John was one of the first to get his message, his gospel message out, where a lot of Bible critics today would say his gospel didn't come out probably until uh, 90 AD, which you would think, I mean, and even in the book of Revelation, that John would have mentioned, well, some of these things that were prophesied have already happened. I mean, hello, uh, what happened uh, a few years ago in our nation and in Jerusalem? No. I'm saying these things from the standpoint of this internal evidence so that you realize that the miracle of what you hold in your hand today as the Word of God supports itself. I don't need anybody to prove to me that the Bible is the Word of God. The Bible proves itself to be a miracle writing and accounting of the truth of God, particularly regarding Jesus Christ and the message, the good news, the gospel message that brings salvation to all who believe. And we're here today and we're saying these things that you might believe. We're saying to you what John said in his gospel. These things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you would have life through his name. So, um, Interestingly, chapter 11 coincides with the end of chapter 11 in John. And, of course, chapter 12. But in John chapter 11, the people of Israel were beginning to gather together for the days of purification. And when we come to John chapter 12, 
John says, and it was six days before the Passover. Jesus died on the Passover. So, kind of do some calendar thinking in your head because this stuff is coming together and these are the moments that took place on planet Earth that changed everything. And particularly for all who believe. This is why I'm standing here today and why this is so important to me that you get it and that you get it right and you understand that historically by the record that God has given to us through holy men of God who spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, you and I have the truth of the gospel. I, uh, I think I'm in the Guinness book for the longest introductions, but my introduction is over. Mark chapter 11. And when they approached Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, which by the way is the place to which Jesus will return as he comes to set up his kingdom, he sent out two of his disciples, and I've checked the other Gospels. None of them say who they are, and I'm not going to even guess. And you're probably, so that's probably you know, two of either Peter, James, or John. Or, we have no idea. He sent out two of his disciples, and he told them, go into the village opposite you. And upon entering it, you will find a colt tied. Interestingly, Matthew talks about a donkey with its foal, with its colt. Here, just the colt is mentioned. It's not an inaccuracy. Certainly not an error. It's just the detail that Mark relates to us. You will find a colt tied upon which no man has sat. <laughs> I guess I say this just about every week, but I grew up on a farm. And uh, there's a term used in the regard of colts. We had, I was past the time of horses, but we had, we, we had ponies. And we had a, a pony upon which man had never sat. The term is an unbroken foal. I had a cousin, Keith. He and I became very dear friends. He was a genius by his own rights. He won awards for his artwork. He would take pictures from National Geographic and he would paint them, making just enough difference in the detail of the painting that he wouldn't realize it came out of National Geographic and he got awards for some of his artwork. Well, Keith was determined he was going to break that pony. And I'm going to suggest to you, and I don't know that much about it, but I think that when it comes to breaking a colt, whether you're talking about a pony or a horse or a donkey or whatever, you'd better get to it when it's young. Because Keith got up on the back of that pony, and I'm telling you, that that animal liked to kill him. I mean, it ran, and it went in circles, and it laid down on the ground, and it rolled on its back, and Keith got back up and went at it again. Uh, he, he had more ambition than he did brains, and he finally gave up. <laughs> But it's kind of interesting that this cult is the choice of God. And by the way, this is prophesied in the Old Testament that this would take place. And uh, we, we have that very clear in Matthew and Luke. And, well, let's, let's read it. Go into the village opposite you, and upon entering it, you'll find a colt tied upon which no man has set. Loosen and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why do you do this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it here. And they left, and 
I'm going to throw in the words, sure enough, they found the colt tied to a gate outside at the crossroad and loosening it. And some of those that stood there asked them, why do you loosen the colt? And they said to them, just as Jesus had instructed, and they released them, and they led the colt to Jesus, and they laid their garments upon it, and he sat on it. And then it tells us that many spread their garments onto the path. I guess this is the way that you would give somebody the red carpet treatment. They laid their garments on the path, and others were cutting branches from the trees, and scattering them in the way. And let's just pause for a minute. This is, this is an STP. Uh, our church does ST, uh, short-term mission, STMs, okay? This is a short-term <laughs> prophecy. Jesus makes a prophetic, he makes a he makes a prediction, if you will. It's more than a prediction. He tells his disciple exactly what's going to happen. And interestingly, as they go out, they find it to be just as he said. Uh, this also happens in chapter 14, uh, beginning there in around verse 12, where Jesus instructs his disciples again to go and as they're preparing for the Passover, uh, he instructs them regarding a specific place and the person that they will speak to that will show them a large upper room furnished and such. And they went and found it to be exactly as he had said. I know what we be. No, we wouldn't. We wouldn't say, well, that's a coincidence. I mean, coincidence are incidents that come together, co incident, okay? But this is more than just a coincidence. This is not only an incident happening just as it was foretold, but even the details of the incident are exactly as the person who makes the, I, I even feel funny saying prediction, who makes the prophecy and those who follow the words here of Jesus see it happen exactly as he had said. I would say that in the days to come, during this week that lays before them, when the disciples became so troubled by things that they saw and heard and the arrest of Jesus and so forth, and I don't want to tell you all of it today because those are sermons for another week, That when the disciples were going like, what is happening here? They might go back to this and say, there's only one way he could have done this. There is only one way that, my, that thing with the donkey's colt, that man with the large upper room with, you know, I'm going to say it like this. This is conjecture. With the table all set, you know, nice, no, not nice works and spoons. I don't know. They didn't use chopsticks either. But uh, it was exactly as Jesus said. And I believe that God does wonderful things like that to us, for us, to help us in our faith. so that we will believe. And you can only imagine that here's this, today we call it a parade. I like to think, now this is really conjecture, that these branches from the trees, that they cut off the trees, and as Jesus is coming, they straw them on the pathway as he is coming down the street. I like to think it was kind of like the wave, remember? When at ball games, they, they did the wave and you know, they'd be sitting in their bleacher cheap seats or whatever, you know, and, and somebody would stand up and raise their hand and the next person stand up. And, and I like to think that as Jesus is coming down the road, now you can imagine this or you can say, Dave, come on. But I think that they took those branches from those palm trees and they laid them down as he comes 
and make a pathway for him. And it was kind of like the wave, just kind of as Jesus is coming into town. If you don't like that, that's okay. I do, okay? And those leading, verse 9, and those following showed and saying, Hosanna, which is similar to what they do in England, God save the king, or uh, in years past, God save the queen. It, it's save, Lord. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom coming in the name of the Lord of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. That's a quote right out of Psalm 118, the 25th and 26th verse. It's, it's interesting. Um, I'm, I'm going to go to one of the other gospels here. That it says that upon the descent of the mountain. So here it just says entering into Jerusalem. And then in Luke it says approaching the city. But in Matthew it says upon his descent from the mountain. And since what we're looking at here this morning is going to one day again happen in reality. As Jesus' feet touched the Mount of Olives and he ends up coming down from the mountain and entering into the city of Jerusalem upon a colt, a donkey's colt. What we're looking at here today is a future incident being played out. Oh, played out according to Old Testament prophecy. So this is more than just a foretelling. This is more than just a coincidence. This is something that was foretold in the prophecies of the Old Testament. And it's taking place in Jesus' experience and life here as he is approaching his death at Calvary, but this is something that is going to take place in a future day as the Lord Jesus Christ returns from glory to establish his kingdom on earth and the Son of God. The King of kings and Lord of lords is going to enter into Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel, and rightly so. He's going to enter into the city upon the, the back of a colt, a donkey's colt. Verse 11. And Jesus entering into Jerusalem, he went into the temple and seeing everything. And I'm going to say to you, he didn't like what he saw. But I like how Mark tells the story, and I believe that Mark got it right, and I, I think the other gospel writers got it right too, but this is a story that's told as it progresses in the other Gospels, and Mark has given us something here that the others, even though they make mention of it, Mark lets us know that Jesus going into the temple and seeing what was happening there, seeing the events of the temple, he didn't go in that day and start throwing everybody out. We're going to find in Mark's Gospel, he goes back the next, he goes back the following day. I <laughs> I had somebody say to me, boy, when Jesus went into the temple, he really lost it, didn't he? Like as if Jesus was throwing a fit and that he had some sort of a temper tantrum. Not at all. I corrected that person. I said, Jesus didn't lose nothing. He got it back. He let them know, this is Father's house. Get out of here. It is to be called a house of prayer and you've made it a thieves den. And he was within his rights. 
And I hope that in churches around the world, that as Jesus returns, he rightfully takes his place and that the house of God is established on earth as the place where prayer is scripturally want to be made and that we are gathered together approaching the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need and know that God will supply all our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Make no doubt about it, the day is coming. Entering into Jerusalem, he went into the temple, seeing everything, the hour already being late. He went to Bethany with the twelve. And if you look at your map, you'll see where Bethany is in the regard to Jerusalem. This is where this is where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived. And by the way, it's interesting that in John's gospel, this is where the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead takes place in proximity to the death of Jesus. And that's all on purpose. That there would be a comparison as well as a comparison by contrast with the raising of Lazarus and Jesus' own resurrection. The similarity of the grave clothes. The body being laid in a grave that was a cave and a stone laid upon it. The issue of Lazarus needing to have the stone taken away and Jesus calling Lazarus come forth. And you can only imagine that he was bound hand and foot with grave clothes. It would have been something like this, you know. And, and Jesus had to say, loose him and let him go. Where in Jesus' resurrection, those disciples looked within that grave and they saw those burial garments that were wound around him that he was wrapped in and they laid right there within that grave as they had been around the body of Jesus. But Jesus was gone. The stone was carried off, carried away from the mouth of the grave. A stone in which no man had ever laid before. When God called Jesus forth from the grave and by his Holy Spirit, Jesus, as we sing, up from the grave he arose. It wasn't like there was a specific. I think that Jesus said Lazarus come forth because if he hadn't, named Lazarus, everybody else that was in that grave would have come forth. Now, I don't think that's conjecture. I, pardon me for saying it, but I think that's the fact, Jack. There's some reality here that you and I need to get a grip on because quite frankly, this is an occasion, this is an occurrence, this is an event that took place once in all of time and eternity and it spells out the hope that we have that the one who rose again from the dead is the one who said, because I live, you shall live also. So back and forth from Bethany to Jerusalem, verse 12, the next day, departing from Bethany, he was hungry and he saw a distant fig tree with leaves. I like this, but you might not, but I, I, I like this. He went that perhaps he would find something on. By the way, what time of the year is Easter? I mean, we're approaching autumn, right? What time is Easter? Come. Spring. Spring. And I don't know, you know something about fig trees. Poor Christopher. Oh, he's been trying to get figs on that little tree. How's the tree doing? Did it do anything this year? Yeah, you weren't able to make a fig nuke. No, no, he didn't have enough to make one little fig cake. I, you, if he ever gets figs on that tree, Grace, you know what you do with pineapple and make those special cakes? Make me a fig cake, okay? Yeah, and if you get a whole bunch of figs, make me some figgy pudding. <laughs> By the way, the figs, you don't find figs on a tree in the springtime. 
Jesus walks up to a fig tree having only leaves and looking for something because he's hungry. And I just want to say it like this, and you can play this however you want, that when the Lord of the harvest comes to you looking for fruit upon you, you better have something ready for him. And here's a fig tree approached by the creator of all things that to be frank with you in the presence of Jesus could have been loaded with things. In, in the earliest part of the spring. And Jesus finds nothing. Nothing except leaves for him. For it was not the season of things. I can see the disciples going, like, what is he doing? And Jesus in response said unto it, no one ever eat from you forever. And his disciples heard him. The other gospels play it a little differently. Uh, Luke doesn't mention it. But Matthew says that immediately uh, the, the, the leaves withered. And, and then as they come back to it the next day, they see that the fig tree has, has withered from its roots up. It's just one dead tree. And you might say, well, I'm not sure about the order of this. Don't worry about it. It's an incident that happened over a period of two days. And whether or not you and I get it right, and I think I've got it right, but whether or not you think it's all right, it's the word of God, and it's right. Verse 15, they came to Jerusalem, and entering into the temple, he began expelling, kicking out those who sold and bought in the temple. You see, when you came to the temple, you were supposed to come prepared. When, when you come to church on Sunday morning, you're supposed to come prepared. I, for the most part, wear a suit and tie, and I did this differently today because besides being the speaker, I was also a Sunday school teacher, so we did a little of the casual thing, but I did wear a vest, okay? But... I prepared myself. In fact, before I went down to the Sunday school classroom, I had some things to ask Matt uh, about what has taken place in the weeks previous and so forth. And by the way, many times on Communion Sunday, I'm here on Wednesday getting the table ready and such so that the communion cups and everything are in place. This last time, because the symbolic cup that we use, I didn't do it until the last minute and I had to ask our elder to uh, help me do that inconspicuously because I was last minute but we prepare our hearts to meet with the king of kings and lord of lords and we want to be ready for him because every Sunday when we gather together he is here gathered in our midst Jesus is coming be ready um in the temple, you were supposed to come ready. You were supposed to have your sacrifice or offering. You were to have your gifts and oblations all in place and ready. And that took some work. If, if you had to come from a long distance, you had to bring a live animal with you. Uh, the condition of that animal needed to be fit and proper and so forth. But what had taken place here is... Somebody got the Myers Thrifty Acres idea of one-stop shopping. You could come to the temple and you could come with your cash and you could buy whatever you needed. And they even had people there to exchange your cash, just like at the airport in Hong Kong. So there was money changers and Jesus goes into the temple and he overturns. <laughs> I just... I don't want to describe this. I'm going to let the word of God say this and you just imagine it. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. He didn't permit that anyone should carry any containers through the temple. And he taught them saying, and this is out of 
Jeremiah 7 and 11, as well as Isaiah 56 and 7. Uh, he said, hasn't it been written that my house is to be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you've made it, you've made it a thief's den, a robber's hideout. And the scribes and the chief priests heard that and they conspired how to destroy him. But they were afraid. For all the people were astonished at his teaching. And when even came, he went out of the city. Verse 20, and early passing by, he saw the, they saw the fig tree dry out from the roots. Peter recalling said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed is withered. Jesus answered and told them, have faith in God for so be it. I tell you that anyone who says to this mountain be ripped up and tossed into the sea and doesn't doubt in his heart, but believes what he speaks happens, whatever he says will be done unto him. And to this I tell you, everything, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you will receive it and it will be done unto you. And when you stand praying for Forgive if you have anything against anybody that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. There's a condition for us in our hearts as we come to the Lord with our requests and with our prayers that our heart is right with God. We say God hears and God answers prayer. But when you and I come to him and approach the throne of grace, and thankfully it's a, a throne of grace and he giveth more grace, there's a need for us to come to him in purity of heart, having forgiven those that we are responsible to forgive. Verse 27, they came again to Jerusalem and walking about in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders approached him and they said, by what authority do you do these things? <laughs> can, can I remind you that they're challenging the authority of the Son of God? Who gave you the authority that you may do this? Who, who do you think you are coming in here like this? But Jesus responded and said unto them, I, I've got one question to ask you. And you answer me. And then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Uh, the baptism of John the Baptist, was it from heaven or from man? Answer me. Ooh. Who's in charge? Who's got authority in this setting? And they reason among themselves saying that if we say from heaven, he's going to say, well, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say it's from man, they were afraid of the people because everyone upheld that John, John the Baptist was truly a prophet. And they answering said unto Jesus, we don't know. Listen to, listen to Jesus' response. And Jesus then said unto them, Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. I love this guy. I, I'm telling you, by not giving an answer, he maintained authority in his rightful place in that gathering there, and no one had anything to respond to. There's another situation we'll be looking at that in the coming week. But for now, I want to say to you today, have you recognized the authority that this man has on earth to forgive sins? Have you recognized as we've gathered together here today and as we consider the, and we have looked even at the history of these things, the responsibility that you have today to this man who he doesn't he doesn't say I'm God he shows it he speaks truth 
He establishes exactly who he is, why he has come, what it is for him to do. Have you acknowledged him today? Have you made him your Savior and Lord? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? We're approaching Calvary where he died that we might be saved. And all of these things that are taking place leading up to this are absolutely essential to prove who he is so that we can look upon this blessed one and know within our hearts we've got the right man. And his name is Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we thank you this morning for divine proof. Whether it comes in the form of internal evidence, whether it comes to us because of historical fact, whether it comes to us because we acknowledge this can be nothing but the truth, or comes to us by divine revelation as your Holy Spirit convinces our hearts that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We pray today that there'd be a mighty movement wherever your word goes forth that many will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Bless us as we sing a closing hymn and as we go on our way, keep us in the love of Christ. Grant us a good week together and we pray, our Father, that our faith would be strengthened by your word through the Holy Spirit of God. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Our song today is Hosanna, loud Hosanna. And we'll just do the first verse. Hosanna, loud Hosanna, the little children sang through pillar, corn, and temple. The lovely anthem rang to Jesus, who had blessed them, was folded to his breast. As children sang their praises, the simplest.